All right, so I'm going to summarize the chapter on Sophia for a few minutes. Then each of you, I assume, read it and have some reaction to it. Then we'll go to the chapter on global feminism. Then I'll see, you know, your reactions to that. And then um, I think we'll be out of time by then. But if not, I can show you, um, we can start looking at that video. And then I would like you to finish looking at it. Um, it's only 50 minutes, so it's shorter. I would like you to look at it before you write your paper. Then you need to come and have office hours with me um, sometime before the paper's due. The paper is due on the 20th, which is five days from now. Um, the word count and the number of quotes is in the syllabus. Um, I will put it also in the post where I put classwork. I, I don't think I put it there at the moment. I was just getting each class, making sure I posted the classes. So, all right. So how do you get all the goddesses together to try and figure out how to create a sustainable world? And Hera needs to talk to her husband and try to get him to reorganize his business or, or politically to, re, to reorganize the political dimension to be more sustainable. And so she agrees to it, but she says, make sure Aphrodite doesn't shoot her arrow into my husband and he goes and chases another woman and make sure that, right, she complains about all the other women. So this part of it is the way that patriarchy divides women against each other. So men are the cause or patriarchy is the cause, but women end up beating up on and harming each other. So Hera's task is to do that. Um, Demeter's task is to raise these children so that they are living sustainably. Don't spoil them by giving a them a bunch of unsustainable things, by making them think that they have to have all this stuff to be happy, by eating junk food, you know, and all that stuff. Try to raise them in a way that's sustainable. To um, Persephone, they say, um, Sophia would say, well, there are going to be climate catastrophes, um, but and certainly women have to get victimized and they need to heal, but you can help them um, heal and then come and join the project of working on sustainability. Um, to, let's see, to Artemis, she says, well, Artemis, you are the woods woman. This is your cause. And we care, we do care about your thing, but don't get so obsessed and so angry and so intolerant of these other things that we care about, or we're just going to get mad and not do anything you say. So, you know, we'll recognize it, but there's other important things too. Life isn't just about causes, it's also about people. And most people want to cultivate their relationships. So they have to do it in a context of developing a sustainable culture. And to uh, Athena, she would say, you're the one who can talk to these powerful men and you can strategize and you can go to the G26 summit in Glasgow and you can get these guys to kick butt and be sustainable. And um, Athena says, yeah, okay. And Sophia says, sometimes you're too, you just wanna be another one of the guys and you just buy into it. You don't criticize them, you need to. And Athena says, well, I can't be effective if, if I just disagree with them entirely. They're not gonna work with me. So I have to do, some things I have to compromise, I have to gain their trust, I have to gain their, 
they believe that I have good judgment, they'll listen to me. So I can't do it without also compromising. And then to Hestia, she says, uh, yeah, Hestia, it's nice to see all these patterns, but you think too much, right? Uh, this, is a, this is an activist sort of activity. And you can explain to people why they should care, but you do need to get out there and explain to people what's going on. And you can't just sit in your house and you know think about think about it. So you have to get out and, and also help the other goddesses as they try to engage in this activity. So um, that was, and then there's Aphrodite, which is. Aphrodite, you've got to stop getting people obsessed about how they appear, about physical beauty, about sensationalism, about material goods, because when you do that and you do it to excess, that's what causes all this consumption. People just want a bigger house, a bigger car, fancier dress. Uh, they want the perfect body all this stuff and it's just killing us, right? They're buying all this unnecessary stuff. So you need to lay up Aphrodite. And she says, um, you can yell at me if you want, but I've got a lot of power. <laughs> and, you know, so the other goddesses just have to say, please, you know, be a vision carrier. Don't be a sex object. Um, so, that's what the idea in that was, was about where we're at. And then the next chapter about um, where I quoted from various women was about creating a vision of where to go, right? Where to go from here. And um, you just have to really re-envision a lot of things because a lot of things will change and so in your lifetime, there will be big transformations, both in terms of women's participation in the culture, but also in terms of um, sustainability, the um, effects of climate change, and then the responses to it. Um, people will have to be a lot more serious about going green because they will suffer a lot. Um, so, all right. I will go around um, the circle and each of you can give your response to that, that reading, the last chapter in the last couple chapters in that book. Okay, so um, let's see, I'll start with Janifa. Are you there? Okay, so if you're there, write something in the um, chat that indicates you're there. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't, I assume students don't just turn on their machines and go and do something else. But I, it's important that you do you know, realize that um, that I, if as long as I don't know anything, I have to assume something like that happened. Um, Kasturi, what have you got? <laughs> Professor, so yeah. I actually found the reading part really really interesting <laughs> because uh, the reading allowed us to um, go through uh, the characteristics of each and every goddesses that we had studied so far and um, I actually got confused at one point like I studied I read out the conversation that Sophia had with other <laughs> goddesses <laughs> and Rishniti, can you please mute yourself Roshani. Hey, 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 Roshani. Hey,
do? What are we going to do? Roshani? You can mute her. Professor, you can mute her. I'm trying to mute her. I'm punching the button. Um, okay. Okay. Punch the wrong button. All right. Go ahead. So uh, actually, I found it really uh, interesting and informative. Uh, uh, but an, is Sophia a goddess? Okay, good. She's actually, I think she's wisdom, right? She's, she's yeah. where, when you get it all together and you get it all balanced out. She's a- Yeah, symbolic. actually, the reading says that uh, she was formed- uh, uh, due to combination of all of these, uh, all of the um, characteristics, you know, like, I mean, uh, she was formed due to something else. And that's why she is uh, indifferent from other goddesses. And uh, I think that, well, I think that she can be taken as a perfect example of a tutor for goddesses <laughs> because going through uh, all the um, conversation that she had with goddesses and the suggestions that she gave her and uh, she also mentions that in each and every part uh, of the conversation, she says that, yes, uh, so uh, women, so listen to me, like, uh, Hera, Hera is right at this point, Hestia is right at this point. So I think that uh, through her conversation with goddesses, uh, I think that we human beings can understand that uh, we, I mean, each and every individual poses uh, some potentials that differs from uh, each of us. And uh, we really have to appreciate the potentials that we possess and we have to listen to what other people tell us as well because uh, without other people uh, telling us that you are wrong at this point, we won't realize uh, what we are committing mistakes, right? What sort of mistakes we are committing, we might not be aware of that. I, actually, my post is going to be really long for this, I guess, because... Uh, I have a lot of reactions um, uh, already written prior to going through the video that you have posted, Professor. Okay, good. That's great. Um, Kaula. Kaula? Okay, oops. She said, um, she's been, you know, her picture's there, but she doesn't seem to be there day after day. So, um, okay. Okay. Oh, Jacinta has, okay, she does have issues. So, okay. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, Fayaza? Yes, Professor. Go ahead. Uh, professor, I don't have any specific uh, like that. Uh, can can you give me a minute? Uh, Did you read the assignment? Uh, no, professor. Okay. Um, Toma. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so when I did uh, their conversation, I really got, uh, uh, it's very interesting. And also uh, I feel very happy to uh, see like this, the women, uh, how they did and discussion and they uh, feel like women need to be sustainable and uh, women, women women need to be do some contribution for uh, create a good society. Um, and uh, their uh, discussion make me feel very uh, inspired to think about uh, also my society. So uh, that's all. Okay, okay, good. Um, I do want to give you a sense. It's not going to be easy, right? But it's uh, it's still worthwhile. It's important. It's just not easy. Um, Mahira. Yeah, I have also similar reactions like Kasturi because I uh, I feel that Sophia was acting like a 
judge, a teacher, a guide, to guide who were telling that these are your good qualities and these are your bad, you should change this and you should go in this way. And then all the goddesses as a good listener were, were actually they were listening to her. She was believing in her. Uh, and then they're complaining that this goddess, this, this thing it is not right. I also want to do this, this. Then Sophia was telling that, yes, you are right. Uh, uh, they should not do this. I, I, like a good judge, good listener, they were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's interesting to know. Do you ever know? I mean, are women competitive? Do they harm each other? Do they steal each other's boyfriends? Or do they, um, you know, envy each other if they marry a powerful man or... Um, compete with other women for who's the best mother or I don't know I mean yes I, yeah okay they compete with each other like I have an example like uh, in my previous school my mother is also a teacher so all other teachers used to come in our house for some party or something so there were teachers Oh, whose uh, whose daughters are also used to study in the same school and they use my mother not my mother but they used to compare that my daughter did this they were competing on this thing uh, uh, like she's the best she's the best I did this thing uh, jealousy is a thing in teenage girls yeah yeah it's you know <laughs> boys are competitive too but I think it's harder girls already lack self-esteem because of all the other ways, you know, that they're treated like they're not good enough. So the competition is more harmful to their sense of self. Does that make yeah. sense to the rest? Does that make sense, Mahira? Yes, but comparative to boys, I think girls are like more competitive in, in terms of their beauty, their body or accomplishment. Okay. I, there's also the possibility that boys compete, but they don't put each other down, right? Down, yes. That's they, right. they sort of respect each other for being competitive, right? So yes, it tends to strengthen their sense of self, no matter who wins, you know, it's a good fight. Uh, it's a good competition, whereas girls, it tends to be humil more humiliating or more self deprecating does that make sense no ma'am not all girls i think it depends of on oneself how an individual person thinks i don't think I, every girl will do that right that's why i do think women in your generation are going to catch on and they're going to support each other a lot they're going to you know really work on supporting each other is that do you think so yes ma'am Okay, uh, Fatima. Hello, Professor. Hello. Uh, in this study, I actually assumed that uh, Sophia is a girl who loves people, and she is described uh, as a girl uh, who never met a uh, dog or cat. Even she, she, she didn't like, and her um, her parents uh, was professor and grandmother as well. In this study, actually, each chapter details with a uh, different events uh, in Shubhya's life. She says um, sleepover with her friends. I didn't quite catch that. Do you want to say it slower? Sophia was what? Uh, she um, she was a young girl. Okay. And she like um, people. Okay. What did you think of the chapter? Reading. The chapter that was attached for your assignment. Well, okay. So the professor actually that you I couldn't find uh, that action yet. 
Okay, I think it was right on the site. Okay, um, Nisali. Okay. Okay. Feel is that as the goddesses did we as human beings, women should start the conversation. Won't be easy, but we should. As Sophia, we need leaders or guides who can take the leading roles. Okay, that's good. Um, I'll tell you at the the summit in Glasgow. Unfortunately. Um, there were 500 lobbyists from fossil fuel producing companies. And what they would do is go and talk to the political leaders, you know, about making deals, right? We'll come to your country, we'll give you jobs, we'll, you know, improve the economy, and we'll, you know, build an oil well or start a mine or whatever, I'm sure. I mean, 500 fossil fuel company lobbyists. And I'm sure a lot of them were women, you know? And so then it's, you know, it's a question of to what extent do you really sell out? Or to what extent do you just try to work from within the system? Um, okay, okay, Rafa. Um, and, um, uh, and that, I mean, you know, all of you, I'm not asking you not, you know, to quit, refuse to get jobs that are not sustainable because those are the jobs that are around. Um, but there's ways, you know, you can find something that's meaningful and then, um, try to work on the other. I am sure that that companies are going to start demanding things, laws will be made, and things will change without you having to sacrifice your future. Um, but, you know, it's all a judgment call on your part of how to balance it all out. Um, so, Nisali, let's see, did you say something, Nisali? Yeah, oops. It was, oh my goodness, what did I do? Okay. Um, stop the share. All right. Um, Nasali. Is Nasali there? Nope. Okay. Um, Habiba. Yes, Professor. I was so sick, Professor. Okay, so you've been sick? Okay. Um, Dolana. Professor. <clears throat> okay, when I read, uh, read the chapter, uh, it was so interesting and uh, <clears throat> it was so inspiring also. Uh, like uh, the goddess uh, Sophia, uh, I found that she was acting as a leader and she was guide uh, like uh, all the other goddess uh, and uh, she was um, acting as a judge and the, she saying that it was right and it's wrong and uh, she uh, uh, like, uh, she uh, uh, guide all others uh, like um, goddesses so it was so interesting and uh, it makes me uh, it's inspiring me that uh, uh, all the others way how can we like um, make the world uh, uh, sustainable for the um, like women so that's all um, I think AUW is going to start a master's program. Yes. In, yeah. In, yes, in, go ahead. Yes, Professor. Uh, I also got this news. 
Is it an environmental something? Or is it an education? I think they have it is that. education. Okay. So that was the, the United Nations has a whole curriculum for educating children for sustainability. So that's nice. Um, I know they're thinking about another one to do with environmental, uh, environmental something. <laughs> I can't remember. But anyway, um, yeah, there, I think there'll be lots of doors open to you if you want to go into some field related to your interest. Again, there's lots of ways to look at it. Um, so Rafa, you didn't get a chance to. Okay, Marzia. Uh, yes, Professor. Uh, it was a really interesting passage. And uh, the most, uh, what I really found interesting in this passage was that uh, it says uh, what we want or what we do or what we believe is what makes us. Uh, and also like it, it talks about a sacred patience that uh, everyone has, every human being has. Uh, uh, which uh, which makes us to to define our way or to choose our way and go on that. For example, uh, uh, like one one person uh, believes and value and respect. Uh, for example, uh, one thing, another person, another thing. Like all the goddesses followed like Hera another way or Ar uh, Artemis another way. Uh, and also, I, uh, I, I think that it has, uh, th this sacred patience has good and bad sides, like uh, what I, uh, I, I, I believe that the good sides is that humans do uh, uh, or, uh, or everything that they think is good for uh, humanity or the, for, the, for the betterment of humanity. Uh, but uh, the bad side is that uh, people allow themselves to do anything uh, because of their sacred patience on humanity or on the name of God or on the name of their beliefs or their culture or their uh, values. So uh, it, it was a really interesting passage. And also the other thing that about Sophia was so interesting for me is uh, that Sophia is wisdom and intellect. So when I think about Sophia's, uh, Sophia's uh, like archetype or uh, character, I think it's so difficult to find such a uh, character because like Sophia collected all the goodness of uh, other goddesses. She was always guiding the, how women should come together and support each other. Like she went and talked with every individual goddesses and asked and uh, and also like everyone had uh, something that uh, was uh, like mm, affected by another archetype. Uh, so I think that, uh, yeah, we live in a world that women are mostly, uh, I believe that the, all problems or most of the problems that women faces is because that men created such a culture. Like, uh, and as an example, in Bangladesh, in rural area, why a girl cannot go outside in late because she was she will be raped by a man who it's not her problem, it's men's problem that creates such an environment. But on the other hand, we as women also uh, affect each others. Anyway, like as the goddesses talk about each others, how they are affected by another archetypal goddess. So uh, I think that we as women should always be supportive to each other and also to always respect each other the way uh, every single one of us are. Uh, Any beliefs that we have uh, as a woman, as a girl, we should not judge how uh, another girl dress, how another girl believes or behave. And also the another thing by reading this passage uh, reminded me was uh, that uh, there is a book, uh, A Thousand Splendid Sand, which is written by, uh, by Afghan-American writer Khalid Husseini. And there is the story of two women, which uh, is that how this girl is like forced uh, to marry by other women in that family. And also how like in the end, how these two women are uh, standing together and fight for their survival. I think like, yeah, this is the story of women in this world that 
in some parts uh, they are against each other but in the end if they stand together they will win so it was uh, really amazing this passage was really amazing for me do you want to write the name of the book and the author in the chat yes of course i will okay thanks um Thank you. sure melanie Um, something that really stood out to me in this chapter was Athena and like her strategy towards everything, because I can understand where she's coming from, like for having to form friendships or like create trust between her and the man she's talking to, because I have a lot of guy friends actually, and that's how you can get them to truly listen to you if you form trust between the two of you and they'll tell you they'll tell you a lot of things about how their mind works and you can slowly try to chip away at that if you just listen to them <laughs> yeah i think in our country we need a lot more people listening um yeah cuz everyone just needs to be heard they need their voice and then you can start, you know, chipping away at, is that really what you want, right? Is that what you want to be? Um, have you thought about the effect of that on somebody else? That kind of stuff. Um, let's see, Jacinta? Are you there? Um, okay. Are you there, Jacinta? Okay. Roshani? Yes, Professor. Did you read? Yeah. Yeah, yeah yes, Professor. Oops. Um, do you want to say what you thought of the reading? Yes, Professor. Can I go after other one? I just got this one. Okay, so mute. Okay, Amina. Uh, yes, Professor. Uh, about the chapter I wrote, it's really nice. I love uh, the conversations of the goddess, what they discuss, and they are uh, really playing a good character of each one. Like uh, they are individually, like saying their own opinion on all, and also judging. So I really love uh, that character and also the conversation. Uh, it's it show a kind of that. Uh, about the about them, like uh, before we already know some of the goddess, but in in the in this in this chapter, we are uh, really got some more information about them. So that's ma'am. Okay, um, and also it gives you an idea when you, if you do get married and have families and have careers and have all these things these voices will start, you know, they'll start arguing with each other, so. Yes, ma'am, it's also give a, a kind of sign to choose uh, our favorite goddesses. It's really uh, great for us. Yeah, I remember. I was trying to stay in school and work with kids at a time when women weren't doing that. That was at age 47. I mean, my oldest one is 47. But it was just like I always felt, and people kept telling, you know, indicating, well, you're not good enough volunteer. You're not good enough going to church. You're not good enough at teaching. You're not good enough, you know, because I was, you're not finishing soon enough with your dissertation. And so, you know, it was because I had five things I was juggling that each person was telling me I'm not good enough, right? but none of them were doing five different things. So that's kind of the thing. And I'm sure a lot of you will have um, 
a lot of you will have a lot to juggle. So it's, it's good to sort of anticipate that. So um, Pooja. Hi, Professor. Hello. Hello, everyone. So uh, the discussion uh, is having and the read readings that have been to made me realize that the judgments, jealousy, and the support that, uh, you know, each human being uh, have. And uh, when I went to the reading that we were assigned to was something like where each woman were directly or indirectly supporting another woman, which was a good thing to hear you know, read about, but if I, you know, I keep, keep myself as an example where I have been uh, someone in the circle with boys always, I have a trust issues with the women. I don't, I might be, I don't know, it might not be, you know, true for all, but like I used to be someone where uh, I still remember the time when I was in grade four and I used to be only one uh, girl in the class and all the all were boys and I used to be so protective and so strong with all men uh, in the classes and since then no matter how I'm studying in women universities I think I find I have a more good connection as a friendship with boys compared to men. So uh, like in the reading, Athena and Sophia, uh, the goddesses and the uh, characteristics they possess, I believe uh, women, not only women, every human being should support each other regardless of their jealousy because I think jealousy is something that every human being possesses regardless of their progress or anything you know good uh, progress or uplift life uplift when it is you know and uh, jealousy should be something positive but in my case what I have found is like jealousy had always made a deep impact uh, rather than more positive because for example if a, if I am with a woman and for example uh, if I am doing something better and, uh, and another woman is not doing she will talk about this uh, thing with other women and she'll this is what I have faced, Professor. I, I won't be like, you know, this is not for anyone. So she will talk about this thing with another woman and uh, she will talk about like how did she get it? What, uh, uh, what were the connections with other persons so that this opportunity was, you know, uh, got by this girl. So I find that's that's why I have a uh, trust issues with women. It doesn't mean I don't support women, but it I find like trusting is more uh, easy for me with boys rather than girls. That's all. Thank you, Professor. Okay, well that that happens. Um, people have experiences, right? And um, they when they get hurt, it's hard to. Um, go from the particular experience you had to some more general situation. Um, so that's uh, why I think it's important if you have an experience to try and do some research to find out, is this common, right? Is this a pattern or is this, um, it's just uh, not the overall pattern. This was the exception. So there's some things that happen to you that are exceptional and some things that happen to you that are just, you know, you know, the what happens to women in a patriarchy, it's, it just keeps a, a pattern that keeps reoccurring. So it is important. And then there's always some girls who prefer the company of boys, like Athena tends to, unless a girl can be just like her and um, Artemis 
well, no, she's actually a man hater. But there are girls who um, do prefer the company of men for various reasons. Um, all right, Breesty. Yeah, Professor, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, for me, uh, the reading was uh, so interesting and like a storehouse of uh, all the information about the goddesses. And uh, Sophia is like uh, guiding all the goddesses by telling their negative and positive sides. And it's so uh, I mean, interesting to me that how the goddesses I mean, reacted to her saying, I mean, uh, without any aggression, they just accepted her was that, yeah, yeah, you were right. And these are our negative sides. But all the goddesses are perfect in their own position. I mean, maybe, yeah, for any situation or there is some causes that they have uh, chosen, that, uh, chose that uh, their characteristic would be like this. Then I'm, I'm, I'm doing that and you are doing that. And also, I mean, it will help uh, us to identify our, uh, I mean, yeah, identify our uh, goddesses and also uh, help us to, you know, uh, I mean, make similarities with us, I mean, easily by this reading. So it's uh, so helpful for me. Yeah. Okay. Um I also wanted to emphasize that it will change, right? You'll change from over time. So there is a Forbes magazine is the big international business one, but they started a program about 50 over 50. And it was about 50 women over 50 who really their whole lives changed and they became a lot more successful. Like their careers started when they were 50 or over. And so some of them were 60 or 70 or 80. And so um, now, just recently, they started 50 over 50 for Europe and 50 over 50 for Asia. So um, I'm going to send you that link. And then you could maybe keep, keep an eye on that. But that'll, that, hopefully, that would remind you of this class that uh, women, when their kids are young, they focus on that. And then as they get older, they focus on something else. And again, because of COVID, because of climate change, I think women are going to start coming out, you know, later in life and helping out and doing all sorts of stuff that they wouldn't have felt compelled to do before. And in women in developing countries, of course, will be motivated because there hadn't been opportunity before. So that will, that will be nice to have. You'll have a whole lot of role models uh, of women in Asia who are doing all sorts of things. So I, I look forward yeah, to it. Yeah. Uh, Sauda? Are you there? OK. Soda. Okay. Um, Taslima. Okay. Um, all right. So that was the first round. Then now the next round was the. Um, yeah, we're gonna do um, to answer. The question there, let's see, where are we? Uh, um, Marzia, uh, Marzia asked about, um, when are we gonna do more post-colonial? And it, the rest of the class is basically related to post-colonial. Um, I also think that when you bring all your own examples, that's part of post-colonial feminism are all those examples you bring. Um, so sometimes it doesn't have to be named that. Let's see. Okay. Um, 
Here's global, global feminism. Yeah, okay, here's the outline. Did you get the reading? Let's see. Did I not send the reading? Let's see. Oh, here, okay. I guess the reading was, um, okay. Oh yeah, it starts out with global, global feminism in general. That's what I had you read up to, yeah, Martha Nussbaum, that's something I wanna bring up because we talked about her before. Um, all right, so there, okay. Here's the reason, um, Marzia, here's one reason I don't have you reading just post-colonial stuff all the time, because um, I do think a lot of it is biased by uh, privileged white Westerners, although, but that's why I always have you find your own examples because I think post-colonialism is really expanding. And so if each uh, student finds something from her own country, then she can get the kind of post-colonial thinking that is most relevant to her. Because if you look at this, um, it has had a, a Western bias. And um, all right, so here's one main division between Westerners and develop, women in developing countries is that the United Nations has a set of rights and the first 20 of them are like very Western, the right to, uh, Healthcare, the right to education, the right to, the right to uh, reproduction, technology, control of your reproductive capacities, the right to um, decide when to marry, the right to a nationality, the right to travel abroad, the right to uh, uh, legal rights, uh, that kind of stuff. And then the next one is economic and social. So the right to a job, the right to healthcare, the right to education, that's the one that focuses on, that was associated with communism and, and um, Russia. Russia and China were interested in these social and economic rights, whereas the West was interested in individual rights. And what the post-colonial women want to say is that, um, a lot of those um, individual rights are the rights of privileged people, right? They, they assume you have food, clothing, and shelter, and you have basic security, and you have all this basic stuff, and now you want this other stuff. Um, where uh, Martha Nussbaum talks about the right to play, the right to um, create your own idea of the good life and pursue it, the right to be engaged in political life. I mean, it's a lot of stuff that people who are just trying to survive uh, want to focus on. What they wanna focus on isn't just getting a job, but the way that the uh, Northerners uh, economically, the exploitation of the wealthy North of the South, the global South and the right to have corporations um, uh, give, contribute, or not exploit their resources, the right to charge companies for using their resources, the right for governments in developing countries to regulate when they come in, how they come in, uh, make them pay for their right. Those are the kind of rights that women in developing countries are most concerned with, is the exploitation that goes on. Um, let's see. So this was one problem that I remember reading about, is that women tend to get manipulated, both in terms of um, not being able to have kids, right, abortions, and then forced to have kids, 
uh, no, not being on given birth control when they want it, all that stuff. And it's all, you know, men who want to control their bodies for one reason or another. Um, and so that's, that's an issue for women, but sometimes Western women focus on uh, the right to birth control, whereas non-Western women might, first of all, they might have social pressure to have children and they'll be ostracized if they don't. So it's just, it's more complicated than just handing a bunch of poor people birth control and telling them not to have more than two kids, you know? Um, because then it starts to, to just seem like another kind of power struggle. But what Melinda Gates said that when she started doing her work, helping women, she got to a certain point where that became her focus. And she was going to try to provide I don't remember computers or something, maybe malaria shots, but I mean, all the women wanted was birth control. <laughs> Just give us birth control. We can't do anything else unless we can control reproduction. So that was her experience. Um, of course, there are women who live in places where they're penalized if they have families that are too small. It's interesting from the students at AUW seem to indicate that they're um, they're not planning to have a lot of to have a lot of kids. A lot of their what sisters cousins seem not to have, not to want big families. Um, so, Newsbaum's list. Now we can go back to Newsbaum's list if you want to. I can go find it, but I do want. I'll just summarize this a bit. And if, if it seems good to go back, I'll do that. Otherwise I could do it after class is over. I could just add a little bit to the video. But if you remember the capabilities model, it had um, all these different capabilities and the United Nations Development Project was to sort of maximize capabilities. Um, Let's see, the goal is produce, uh, yeah, okay. So here's another questionable, assign, questionable pattern that was going on is that Western feminists would come in there and they're gonna help women. And ultimately what happened to these women is that they were helped by um, being told that they should want to have a job outside of the home and they get conditioned to want to work outside of the home. And it turns out they end up working for Western companies at a really low salaries. And um, like the garment industry, that's a, the garment industry is a good example to me because within the countries, the conditions in those uh, garment factories are tend to be really bad because women work there and they won't complain. And then the, the clothing is really cheap. And so what do, if Western women buy, buy it because it's cheap, then they're reinforcing these terrible conditions onto the workers. And so on the other hand, if the workers get better conditions and salaries, then the prices go up and then Western women don't buy as many. And then the women in the developing countries lose their jobs. So it's really awful. But I will say that my, my daughter and my son-in-law were actually, their jobs are, were focused on that. So there are programs, our government runs, where um, the, it's to try and reduce slave labor. So the US government will come in with uh, a set of regulations for worker protections, the number of hours you work, the conditions of work, the safety, the um, these just, you know, so it's not slave labor. I'm sure the, the buildings have to be built to codes so they're safe. And then if they do that and they comply, 
and my son-in-law is going over to these countries to see if they're complying. And if they are following the rules, then they can export the product to the US without a tariff. So that would mean that the price wouldn't go, the price would be the same for the women consumers, but the money would actually be going to paying for those higher salaries. So that's one way to get around it. Um, but I, you know, I do think that there is always this problem. Are you just being conditioned to work for um, international companies? Now, again, I think AUW is set up so that you get encouraged, you're not forced, but by going into public health and these other um, majors, bioinformatics, and then there's a lot of connections that the school has with NGOs and government. So you can get you know, jobs that aren't just working for Western corporations and helping them get richer. Um, so I think that's nice. AUW has sort of accounted for that. Um, let's see. Um, all right. So um, yeah, women's oppression, they identify more with the problem of uh, colonization rather than just being oppressed as women. Um, it's their whole country that's gotten mistreated. Women are the world's proletariat. They do all the really dirty work and get paid almost nothing, right? We've, we talked about that before. Um, what about the cultural values at home? Um, how has that been commodified? We've talked about that before. Um, oh yeah, this history of borrowing money and then the interest rates went up. And so these countries have big debts to the wealthy countries and that's costing them a lot. They have to spend a lot of their GNP way, uh, paying back. You could check that for each of your countries because I know it's really bad in South America, but I'm not quite sure what the situation is in uh, Southeast Asian countries. So if you wanted to see, I don't know, you just keep typing in stuff until you'd be able to find that. Um, that's a kind of recolonization. So what happened under colonization is that um, like India would um, grow cotton and grow tea and then it would get exported to Britain and they would make uh, clothing and um, tea bags and then they'd sell it back at a huge profit, right? So in this case, um, the countries took out these loans and now their workers have to, have to work. And then the money goes over to the other countries to pay back these loans. And then they sell them these products. So the products that the people make get sold over in the developing countries at a, at a price that isn't fair because they take whatever price they can. But then they can't make the products that their people need. So the products, so they end up buying products from the West <laughs> instead of just making their own products and buying their own products. So that's like a recolonization. I hope you understand that. Um, there's the, the companies do not pay the cost of the destruction of environment, water and air. That's called externalizing. It's not considered their responsibility, which is a terrible thing. Um, and then the idea that we shouldn't aspire to this Western good life because it's, it doesn't, well, it's not sustainable. It doesn't make people happy. Um, so then there was this question about the language of rights um, and transnational feminism it um, assumes a kind of universality and it really 
oftentimes uh, imposes Western standards, okay? It might be well-intentioned, but it's condescending. Um, so, so when I was reading this, I was honestly thinking the examples she uses, it seems to me, it sounds like a lot of adult women who are trained, you know, academics, and they've come up with a set of concepts and they think their concepts are universal and they have good intentions, but then the, the people in the colonized countries say, no, you know, you're assuming so much. You're, why are you using rights language? Why are you doing this? Um, your language is not, you know, you have political rights but you're not looking at what's going on economically and all the economic exploitation. And you're not talking about, does a corporation have a right to exploit us like this, right? The rights language is, is almost doesn't include at all the economic sector. And if you remember the capabilities list, the last thing on the list was the right to own property. The last thing on the list had anything to do with economics. And so none of those other rights are that important if you've got this incredible economic exploitation going on. So, um, so that, that's how I had it pictured. And that's partly why I wouldn't assign this material to you because I do think it keeps imposing stuff. And so, um, what I was thinking though, while I was reading it is because I've never taught the class this way before is you could think about this. If the goddesses languages, language helps get over all this stuff, or, you know, if you wanna look back and think, no, I think Dr. Beck, she might've had good intentions, but she really was, imposing Western categories or something. Um, you know, it's like, uh, I hope not, right? I think, you know, the passion to be a mother, the passion to be a wife, these, I don't think they're particularly Western or non-Western. And then I always let my students explain, right? How they interpret the stuff. And so when I, when I read her chapter, it just seems like two adults who already know stuff and they're telling each other stuff. And I just think it's not really talking about students. I don't think students are like that. They aren't that arrogant. They aren't that sort of determined to know that they're right. But I don't know, I've lost track. All I know is um, I learn a lot from you. And I want to, I change my mindset because of what my students say, or I expand it all the time. Um, but, you know, it'll be up to you to read these chapters and sort of think about how would you have an education that, I mean, definitely you need to be reading women in your countries and post-colonial stuff. And so um, I, you know, I'll just keep thinking about whether I'd include more of that. And then also whether you would get that in another class, because I know a lot of other classes at AUW have post-colonial, so I can check the curriculum, you know, to make sure you don't have too much overlap. But that would, those are my thoughts about that chapter. So now each of you can give your own thoughts about the chapter. Um, Janifa? Did you have a reaction? I guess not. Um, Kasturi? Um, yes, Professor. So uh, I actually don't have specific examples. Uh, related to what I studied from the reading. But then, uh, yeah, I think that even though we uh, females are aware of what are our rights and what are we supposed uh, 
to do in order to get the freedom to exercise our rights. Uh, we have been uh, occupied with lots of conservative thoughts in our society because of which we have not been able to exercise our fundamental rights. I mean, um, so actually global feminists, they think that women poses the potential to exercise their rights and uh, so if they become able to exercise their rights then only they will be able to fulfill their ambitions and goals in life right but then uh, if i have to tell uh, if i have to talk about uh, these stuffs in context of nepal i have to say that uh, we we are under a very conservative and traditional society where um, women are restricted to restricted to uh, do certain things that might uh, uh, make the reputation of the society get down or something like that. Uh, I mean, most of the women in the city areas, they are uh, able to exercise their rights. They are able to move forward. They are able to compete in the national level as well. Uh, it's not that none of the women from Nepal, they are uh, very good leaders and uh, they are working for the welfare of other females. But then uh, I think that there are more ruler paths in Nepal uh, where women are not even allowed to get educated because uh, because uh, the we have uh, many generations in the country and old people of old generation, they think that um, females, they are uh, not uh, born to get educated as they are uh, supposed to be uh, in their in-laws home after they get married. And uh, after getting married, it's, uh, it's the responsibility of females to look after their kids, their in-laws house and stuff like that. They are uh, they are, I mean, when I look at uh, females who have much more, I mean, who have much more responsibility to carry out and they give birth to so many children, I feel like women in most of the paths, they are just treated as a child um, bearing machines, but with it is actually not true, right? So uh, I think that uh, educating females is really necessary in order to establish themselves as a global feminist uh, who can actually uh, strive to educate other females around them and uh, uh, work together in empowering all the females. Okay, good. Um, Kaula, are you there? Kaula. Fayaza. Uh, yes, Professor. For me, like, uh, I'm thinking like uh, it's like a Kasturi said one. So uh, every woman's like have the agency. Uh, they have the uh, specific rights, right? So they can use, they can overcome through their rights. So that's my opinion. Okay. Um. Yeah, the point of this chapter is that as you go forward, you're going to run into the fact that the world economic system is exploiting your country, right? And so it makes it hard for you to develop and it makes it hard for you to educate poor, you know, people in your country who are poor and get isolated they don't get a chance. And so that just reinforces their conservative ideology. So you have this link between the economic system that's exploiting your country and the ideology where your people, you know, oppress themselves or each other. So those kind of um, interlap, interact in these uh, ways that are very much to your disadvantage and make it harder. Does that make sense, Fayaza? Yes, Professor. Yeah, just like the whole sustainability thing, like the global economy depends on fossil fuel. Well, then countries suffer all these catastrophes. Well, then 
how do they develop very much when people are just trying to survive? So um, it's complicated. Um, Toma? Yes, ma'am. So my opinions are also same as Kasturi. Um, in, our, in our country, I also saw though the women know their rights, but they do not have the power to go forward their ambitions or their contribution over the society. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we saw in our country, there are many uh, women who are living in urban areas where they get all the rights or opportunities, and uh, they also get all the support from their families um, and their relatives. Uh, and uh, um, they get for uh, higher education outside. Uh, they do not have any boundary line. But uh, if we consider the rural areas in our uh, in our country, so it's a need to uh, huge changes because of the people mentality is so um, unreliable and uh, they just think that uh, women do not uh, need to get education. Also, they think that women do not need to go outside because the men are here to help them to whatever they want, they can buy them or uh, they can do all of our, what their needs. And so, um, so they need to just stay home or they need, do not need to give any contribution for the society or economics. So the things like that, that's why the women do not do have the power um, to contribute some things for good, uh, for get, uh, making a great society, but they do not. Okay. Um, all right, so I mean, in your lifetime, you just have to keep working on making it better, right? Um, but you do have yes, to go definitely. away and get educated and get a good degree before you can really make change. I think education is necessary. Yes, yeah, okay. Mahira? Yes, ma'am. Uh, in our society, like women do not have control on their body if they get if they don't get pregnant, this is also her fault. Uh, and if she, uh, because uh, a, a woman is complete, is taught that a woman is complete when she is a mother here. And then if she gets a lot of kids, then it's a burden to her that like she's a proletariat, she will have to do everything for her family, for feeding and every task. For example, I haven't, uh, there is a house help in our, in my home. She's been there for 19 years now. Uh, and her daughter was born in our home. Uh, so the, when she was 14, the daughter, uh, they got her married. And now she's 16 and with a kid. Uh, now she's pregnant, actually, four months pregnant. Um, her, husband, uh, to, uh, her husband is very violent. He kicked her on his neck, in, his, in her belly. And now they, uh, now she has, she became very weak. Now she came to our house. Uh, we brought her in our house and uh, her mother now don't intend to give her back to him. They want divorce. And uh, we were actually explaining them to not to give her, not to get her married, uh, but they didn't listen. Now they're fighting for it, against it. Yeah, that's too bad. Oh gosh. It's, yeah, people's lives can fall apart pretty easily. Um, Dohan, Dolana? Yes, ma'am. Uh, <clears throat> I want to say, like Mahira said uh, uh, already, like in our society, like women are uh, like, uh, <clears throat> like uh, men are uh, like uh, our society, uh, is uh, like male dominated society women are mostly uh, like uh, <clears throat> oppressed uh, by the men and they are always uh, uh, like uh, when uh, they don't have control uh, like uh, uh, on their body uh, like uh, when they have uh, they don't have any kids they are like uh, they our society people said that they are responsible for this 
like why they they don't have like any kids or uh, like uh, they don't have any ability to like give birth or something like that uh, another way like uh, when <clears throat> any woman have um, like uh, only uh, like girls kids uh, then it's also responsible uh, to the like uh, like woman like why she give birth only like girls kid why uh, she don't give birth uh, any boy like our our society like uh, like only like uh, uh, blame to women so it's it's the <laughs> mindset and it's mainly happen in the rural area like uh, in village, uh, in rural area, the women are mostly working uh, in uh, inside a home. They are don't allow to going outside, and uh, and so uh, they they need to change. Yes. So our right. our society need to change this mindset, and uh, they need. If they have enough education that women have the uh, ability to do outside works and um, they can okay. do anything. I got to cut you off. We got 10 minutes and 10 people, I think. But anyway, yeah. yeah. Rafa, that's good, Dolana. Rafa, okay. Marzia? Yes, Professor. Did you have comments on that reading? Uh, uh, professor, about the passage uh, about the feminist thoughts and uh, global feminists, uh, I think that uh, like mostly the uh, the biggest parts that it talks is about the women's like uh, the, the the girls even uh, in uh, operation like uh, the example of India and China. So uh, for me, this part is the saddest part because like the, wor the world, even it's not in one single society, it's in the most societies that a girl before uh, she is born, the society decide about her or uh, they decide that even she lives or not, even the parents are the only two people who decide that she comes or not. But if they realize that if this is a girl, they decide to abort it. Uh, so the example was so clearly in India and China that they want to check and if this is a girl they want to abort. So uh, uh, I think that in the, in these sports, uh, so yeah, uh, the societies uh, the societies need to be uh, uh, like especially women educated. They should define that yeah I am a woman if my girl if I give a bird a girl so yeah I want her uh, to be it doesn't matter if she is a girl or she is a boy I want to do like um, I want her to be the same as men so the only things that we can believe that yeah women and men are equal and to separate the feminist thoughts is that yeah women themselves should believe it and also the, that women should, I, I think that women should work even harder than men because the society is ready to accept men, but they are not ready to accept women. So they should work harder to make them, their uh, existence accepted by the societies that, yeah, we exist, yeah, we can do better. Yeah. And also women should take part uh, beyond, uh, like beyond their rights. Because because if they only think about their rights, so they will be so limited. They should take the, the roles that yeah. men do in the society. Yeah, I I agree. <laughs> okay, we got to keep going. Melanie, um, so something that when I was reading this chapter, it reminded me of an essay I'm writing. And the title is, um, Are Women Too Poor to Work? Okay. And so it compares like how much daycare actually costs compared to the salaries that women make working. And statistically, women can't afford daycare if they have a job, causing them to not be able to work and have to stay home with the kids. And I mean, that's just one way 
that the economy affects women in a huge way because at that point they have no income and they're unable to provide for their families and they have to rely on the man or whoever their partner is. Yeah, and then they don't get work experience. So when the kids do get older, they don't, they have nothing. Um, yeah, I know that because I paid part-time daycare. It was 25% of our income just for part-time, right? Um, but the thing is in the US also, there's part of a bill the Democrats want to pass for free daycare, right? But that's socialism and that's not going to pass. So the government doesn't help out either because that's considered anti-capitalism. <laughs> All right, uh, Bristy. Uh, professor, and, uh, for me, I mean, I have a friend that, uh, I mean, they have six children in, in her family. I mean, along with five, five are girls and, and uh, one is a boy. I mean, to say that uh, just for I mean, getting a boy, her mother, I mean, take uh, six children. And at the last when in her mother, got a boy then i mean they stopped that yeah uh, that i mean now this is fine we have uh, i mean life supporter for them uh, and uh, also uh, in our locality here uh, i mean there is a society called i mean telugu society maybe you know that but so in their society you know uh, in the early maybe yeah they are the people who I mean, got their uh, girls uh, marriage early uh, and I, I, mean, I have a student uh, whom I used to uh, I mean, tuition in her uh, family. So I mean, after getting a chance in this varsity, I, mean, I have to stop my tuition because of, uh, I can't manage uh, the time. So after uh, I mean, uh, two Two or three months, I heard that I mean, she got married with a person I mean, near to her house. Just for I mean, she was a I mean, brilliant student. So yeah. I mean, and and uh, her mother is also a teacher, but uh, she can't I mean, understand that how I mean, in the early age, uh, I mean, she agreed that uh, her girl has to be married at this age. Yeah, I mean, that's, so. yeah, I actually just wanted you to try to focus on something in the paper, in the essay, but um, so Habiba, do you have something? So we have five minutes. Um, Fayaza, do you have anything? I think Roshani probably has something to say, right? I wanted to say on this topic, like for the post-colonial feminism in the reading of this, um, I when I was initial to this feminism concept and feminism thing, uh, there were so many things related to this post-colonial feminism, which uh, had a misleading information and misleading thing, uh, which I used to hear, you know, regarding that um, since the Asian, uh, since the, for the Asian and poor countries uh, who are bounded with cultural values and their own uh, religious values, it is uh, it has always been said that you have been colonized culturally by you know by the modern or Western feminists because they are just trying to impose their own thing on you, which is not appropriate culturally as well. So these are the things that I had been observing and listening because. Um, for the Eastern women and for the women's in the Asian or from the poor countries is um, they are, as I said, they're culturally bounded if they are going against and following the same trend uh, of, uh, you know, Western families relating to the dress up, relating to the, you know, living free life, um, like uh, moving ahead, working and everything. So that has uh, some negative uh, effects uh, seen in women and so many no negative things uh, that women had been hearing. And other than 
understand that uh, the, the way that the thing that you said that we read about right to education right to reproductive health it is a good thing uh, it is something the positive thing has also been spreaded in the colonial thing but uh, but uh, the cultural thing has always affected women to move ahead uh, the the stories or the thing um, that people have used uh, people says related to the westerners and easterners the comparison between these things and also professor for examples uh, i think uh, maybe not but uh, the westerner women uh, the western not all but maybe western women western feminists actually they uh, they see the women of eastern society or the poorer women as uh, you know in the eye of sympathy like oh my god maybe she is she is from this country so maybe she doesn't have the proper rights or if, or let's say like if the women is fully dressed culturally dressed or not you know not in a dress in appropriate dress or not doesn't know how to speak english or from a very remote area then the uh, the people view her as a very you know a very uh, in a sympathy like looks in tries to give a sympathy telling that oh my god maybe you are very poor maybe you are underprivileged maybe you don't know the right thing or maybe uh, your background is bad maybe you don't have a right to explore or something like that while it cannot be true like the women we were not following western culture or western dresses can also be active can also be uh, vocal and can also be empowered in herself right but these are the things that uh, uh, there is something that uh, these are these things also arises uh, like the neg um, misinformation or mis uh, myths regarding to uh, the women of eastern society and western society but apart from that as i said the reproductive rights and you know uh, the health women's rights are always there and i really support regarding the um, post modern feminism and colonial feminism yeah, yeah. okay okay um so i have one i'll just read a, a sentence here a couple sentences it says um we really need to question what we mean by education right which types of knowledge uh, the understanding privileges how providing education and employment to women in the global south also has multiple structural effects that often remained understudied, most notably, it ties them into a global capitalist economy of production and consumption in which they face a new sort of oppressive, oppressive relation. So, um, so you can, the, the video that I want you to listen to or watch does have a section, a big section about education. And so this is on page um, 150 is also, so you can think about what kind of education, you can think about how some of the people, some of the best and the, the brightest in your countries like you are getting educated to just fit into Western molds, um, like STEM research, is that, is that to work for Western corporations? Is it to work for your own countries, but to keep trying to develop like Westerners are developing? Um, so, and then what about liberal arts education? Do you think that's a good kind of education to get over, you know, um, the Western domination? So trying to think of what is a colonial-based education, what is a post-colonial education? Uh, what it is you study, how you study it, um, what what sort of goals that you're pressed for, you know, that are encouraged for what to do with your education, and I, I then you can compare AUW to other universities. Um, I don't know. As far as I know, it's um, I think they have a good plan. I don't know. Um, you know what your own experience is but anyway you could I, you should reflect on it a lot um and so i hear that that you're all going back to campus on january so that's great um i can't go 
Uh, one good news for me, like I am going early, like uh, Rania gave me email that oh, okay. I, uh, well, she I'm... gave permission to uh, yeah. go to campus in fifth December. That's great. I just hope all of you can um, get your visas and get your, you know, transportation and get back there. Yeah. So, uh, I have to, I have to be ready for this. Yeah. Okay, well, goodbye. And I'll remember to look at that video to write, start writing your papers, to make an appointment for. Uh, Professor, I have another last question. Okay. Like, uh, for you the second. So the rest of you can go. Go ahead, Delana. Professor, for the second paper, uh, like how, why, what is the word limits for? Well, it's in the syllabus way at the bottom of the, but I'll I'll put it on there. This is the third paper, I think. Professor, second paper, I think. Yes, Professor, second yes, paper. Yes, Professor. Like the second paper. Of, mm, okay. Uh, you had a research first. paper. One, yeah. and this is the second. And okay. The final paper. I thought you had an earlier one about, I don't know, maybe not. That's fine. Uh, that is it due on 20th? Yeah. Second. Okay, Professor, I have an exam. Can I go? Yes. Yes, go. Okay, okay Professor, Lana. thank you. Of course. Thank you. Yeah, okay. All right, well, let's see. No, I didn't send it. Oh, stop.